Man, what an exciting time of worship that was. That was awesome. Thank you, Dan, for being back with us. We really appreciate you. And the way that he leads us in praising our Heavenly Father is just amazing. We're so thankful for it. And thankful that you're here. Thanks for being here on a really special day for us. If you're new, it's going to seem like, man, there's a lot going on today. It's, it's not every, no, it's every week. Every week we do everything you're about to, to see today. It's amazing. You wouldn't believe it. Thanks to all of you that are joining us online as well. Thanks for being a part of this and tuning in this morning. We've got a special Sunday for you. Not only do we get to worship God through our singing, we're about to worship God through his word. Later on, we've got the Compassion Journey in the Activity Center. We've got Summerfest out in the parking lot today with all kinds of fun stuff for you to enjoy. But what I want to invite you to do right now is to just take a deep breath with me. And after those songs that Dan led us in, we could all use a deep breath. Man, those were some exciting songs, okay? So on the count of three, I want to ask you to just take a deep breath with me, okay? Ready? One, two, three. (sighs) Doesn't that feel good? Isn't that good? Here's why I want you to do that. I want you to just let the stress of the week and the distractions of the week and all of the anxiety of the week, just kind of put that on the shelf for a bit because we're going to go to the word of God and we're going to study his word together and we don't want any of that stuff to cloud out what he's going to communicate to us today. I want us to really think about our passage for today, our text for today. I want us to think about it carefully. And so I've actually invited someone to come up and read the scripture for us ahead of time. And you can turn there in in your Bibles if you want. It's Luke chapter 12. We'll put it on the screen as well. Tony Talopoli, would you come up here? Tony's been at our church for eight, nine months now. His family's here. They're part of a small group here. And I asked Tony if he would be willing to read the scripture for us today. Think carefully about these words because we're going to study them in a little bit. Thank you, Tony. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'll be reading from Luke 12, verses 13 to 34. Then someone called from the crowd, Teacher, please tell my brother to divide our father's estate with me. Jesus replied, Friend, who made your judge over you to decide such things as that? Then he said, Beware, guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. Then he told them a story. A rich man had a fertile farm that produced fine crops. He said to himself, what should I do? I don't have room for all my crops. Then he said, I know, I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. Then I'll have a room enough to store all my wheat and other goods. I'll sit back and say to myself, my friend, you have enough stored away for years to come. Now take it easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, you will you will die this very night. Then who will, who will get everything you have worked for? Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. Then turning to his disciples, Jesus said, this is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food to eat or enough clothes to wear. For life is more than food and your body is more than clothing. Look at the ravens. They don't plant or harvest to store food in barns, for God meets, God feeds them, and you are far more valuable to him than any birds. Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And if worry can't accomplish a little thing like that, what's the use of worrying over bigger things? Look at the lilies and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Salmon, in all his glory, was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for flowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? And don't be concerned about what you eat and what you drink. Don't worry about such things. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers all over the world. But your father already know your, need, already know your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all these, above all else, and he will give you everything you need. So don't be afraid, little flock, for it gives your father a great happiness to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to those in need. This will store up treasure for you in heaven, and the persons of heaven never get old or develop holes. Your treasure will be safe. No thief can steal it, and no moth can destroy it. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Would you all pray with me? God, we want to be receptive to what you have to tell us today from your word. 
And, and we're, we just, Tony just shared with us the words of Jesus in Luke chapter 12, and they are as meaningful and important to us today as they were back then. Sometimes it doesn't feel like it because we didn't get to hear it when it was originally given, but Lord, I pray that you would help us to see this passage in a fresh way today. Probably a lot of us have read this multiple times, but God, I pray that you would reveal to us some new insights that, that we need to know in our lives today. Help us to see areas that we need to surrender to you, Help us to see things that we need to confess, sins that we've held on to, Lord. Help us to see how you want us to live because Jesus gave us such incredible instruction here. And, and sometimes we don't always connect where that applies to our life. So God, I pray that, that during this time that we have together to study your word, that, that we would really, really zone in on what you have to say and that your Holy Spirit would do his work in our hearts, God. Help us to see the things you want us to see. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, let me give you some context here. It was January of 2020 when Pastor John and I got the opportunity to go to Ecuador with Compassion International to see the kind of work that they do there. We went with Rick Shoup, who's the pastor of Salem Evangelical Free Church. We went to the Ecuador to see how Compassion works. And I looked all over this week to find a picture of John, Rick, and I together. And this is the only one I found. So don't blame me. <laughs> this is the only picture with the three of us in one shot. All of the pictures are of one of us taking the picture and the other two are in it. But this is the only one with all three. So excuse the selfie. So I got to be honest with you. I approached this trip fully expecting to be disappointed. I approached this trip with compassion, expecting to find out that, and this is kind of us going through the, the, the rough terrain there, trying to get to some of the places. I expected to have major concerns with the financial accountability, with the methodology and how they were doing things. And I need to explain why would I be so skeptical going into this? It's because for several years, my wife, Jenny, and I ran a ministry called Extreme Impact, where we took hundreds of high school and college students around the world. This was one of our groups getting ready to go out to eight different places at once. And we did this multiple times a year where we would train people, send them out to do missions work in very poor areas, impoverished areas, not, not exclusively, but that was a lot of what we did working with international partners all over the world to help people and families and children in poverty. And so over the course of those many years, I have seen it done well, and I've seen it done very poorly. I have seen child sponsorships done well, and I've seen them done very poorly. And the problem is a lot of times people will set up an organization or a ministry under the cloak of we want to help people, and maybe it even starts that way. And then over time, the money that's involved, or sometimes it's set up this way to begin with, it turns into an operation that's really just meant to line the pockets of the people running the thing, and it doesn't actually do much to help the people they're claiming to help. That's one category. Another category is people who mean well, and they're trying to do good things, but they don't really know what they're doing. And so in the process of trying to help people with genuine motives, they actually end up hurting them more than they help them. And so they create this kind of enablement mentality what we call paternalism, a dependency where people start to depend on the outside resources and influence coming in to help them. And they're not actually lifting anyone out of poverty. They're just making them dependent on someone for a better lifestyle. And I've seen so much of this that honestly, the bad experiences have kind of outweighed the good. And I walked into this opportunity to go visit what Compassion is doing in Ecuador with John and I together thinking I'm probably going to find the same thing all over again. But we've got to check to be sure. This is an opportunity for us to actually see, are they doing the right things? And, and honestly, those few days in Ecuador opened my eyes to a way of lifting people out of poverty that I had never seen before. It took me a few days to wrap my head around it because I didn't fully understand how it worked. And I want to get into a little bit of the strategy later on and the methodology and why, as a church, we think this is an important long-term partnership for us. Why we raised money last year to plant a church in Peru through Compassion and the Christian Missionary Alliance, which is a denomination or organization that very much aligns with our beliefs. Why we think God is going to do a work in Huamachuco, Peru, that we want to be a part of and we want to invite you to be a part of. But before we do that, I want to answer the why. 
Why is it that we would do this at all? Why would we take resources that we could spend on vacation or a new car or going out to eat or new toys or some other fun thing that we want to do? Why would we take those resources and send it over 3,000 miles to people that we've never met who don't even know that we exist? Why would we do that? That's what I want us to study today in Luke chapter 12. So I hope that you've found Luke 12 in your Bible Tony read it for us earlier, so I'm not going to go through it verse by verse and read everything again. I want to point out five things to you. I want to point out five key aspects of this passage where Jesus is teaching that we can learn from. And by the end, I hope that you will walk away with some really good application for your life. The five things we're going to talk about are a question, a story, an application, a principle, and an action. That's the journey that we're about to go on for those five things. Let's dive right in. The question is in verse 13. If you look at verse 13, there's this man that comes to Jesus. He says, teacher, teacher, which was a word that was synonymous with rabbi. Teacher, please tell my brother to divide our father's estate with me. Now, here's the thing. Back in this day and age, the eldest brother usually got a bigger share of the inheritance. In fact, that was actually a biblical thing. Deuteronomy 21 says that the oldest brother was supposed to get a double portion of what the other siblings got. Now, as an oldest brother, I am okay with that. But if you are not an oldest brother, you may not be. You may be thinking, that's not quite fair, is it? And I, I wondered about this. I didn't really have a good answer to the fairness of this. I just always accepted it as God's approach because I'm the oldest brother. But when I was in Bethlehem a few years ago, I got to talk with a Palestinian Arab about this very thing. And he said, the way it works still today in Palestine is you have many people where there's a family business that gets passed down from generation to generation, and there's family wealth that comes with that. And the eldest brother is expected, it's an obligation, it's a cultural obligation for him to get that as an inheritance, but to also take on the responsibility for caring for the family. So yes, there is a greater portion of the inheritance, but there is also a massive responsibility that is coming with that. And so the oldest brother is expected to take on the family business, whatever that is, even if it's not his passion, even if it's not living his truth, even if it's not what he really enjoys. He has to take on the family business and keep that going. Why? So that he can provide for the family so that his younger siblings can go off to college and do what they really want to do with their life. So the younger siblings get to go off and study to be a teacher or a doctor or a lawyer or whatever profession they want to do, and they get to better their lives that way and hopefully better the family. But the oldest brother has this expectation, this obligation that he's going to take on the responsibility of the family patriarch and provider, even if he hates the business, because it's what's going to help the whole family move forward. Yes, there's a double portion of the inheritance, but there's also this huge obligation and responsibility that comes with it. Now, one of the things we see in this story is that Jesus accuses the man of being greedy. And you know what that tells me? That tells me that it's not that this man didn't get anything. It's not that he was destitute, poor, had nothing. That's not it at all. See, the, the law said that the oldest brother gets a double portion, not that he gets everything. And so this man got some inheritance. It wasn't enough. What he's saying is, I'm not happy with a third. I want 50-50. So teacher, rabbi, Tell my brother, because he'll listen to you, he won't listen to me. Tell my brother to, to, to split this up evenly with me. I mean, fair is fair, that antiquated law. You know, that's not something that I've heard you teach about Jesus. So I think you'll back me up on this. And so the question here that the younger brother gives is, would you tell my brother to give me more of the inheritance? That's the question that we start off this passage with. And Jesus sees right through this man's question to his heart. What's really going on inside? He doesn't even answer the question the man asks. He answers a much deeper question. He says, beware, guard against every kind of what? Greed. Guard against every kind of greed. He's accusing this man of being greedy. He says, life is not measured by how much you own. And then Jesus, his standard operating procedure is make a point, tell a story. Or make a story, tell a point. I mean, that's kind of how it works with him. And so he's going to give us a story here, a story that the gist of it is basically a rich man who cares more about his money than God is a fool who will lose everything. And we read the story earlier, but let me just give you a brief synopsis of it. There's this rich man who's very successful, and he decides that he wants to build extra barns to store all of the great wealth that he has to essentially hoard it 
for later so that he'll never have to worry about not having enough again. He's going to just amass more and more wealth and keep it all to himself so that he can live a long and happy life and not have to worry about anything. And God's message to him is, you're a fool. You're a fool if you think that amassing resources is going to guarantee you a long and happy life because it can't guarantee happy and it can't guarantee long. In fact, you're going to die this very night. And then God says, who will get all your stuff? Who will get all that stuff that you have amassed? Now, let me just pause right there because I want to ask you a question. And sometimes when I ask a question, it's rhetorical. I ask a question because I want you to think about it, not say anything, and I'm going to give you the answer. This is not one of those times. So I'm going to ask you a question, and I actually want to hear your thoughts. I'm telling you that so that you can be thinking about it as I ask the question. What would you say to this question? How do you and I show that we care more about resources than about God. How, what are some ways that you and I demonstrate that we care, or maybe not us, our neighbors, those around us, the person sitting next to you, demonstrate that we care more about our resources like the rich man than about God? What do you think? How we use our time shows it. What else? Our money, how we spend our money, what we spend it on. What are some things that we spend on that show we care more about resources than God. House, a bigger house. Clothes, what else? Toys. Entertainment. What was that? I'm not sure if I heard Portal, which is a video game, or Wordle, which is a fun online game. The online Wordle, so really Wordle. Okay, all right, good, good, good. I thought I was confused on both accounts, but thank you. <laughs> what else? How do we show that we care more about our resources than about God? Yeah, I want a new car. What's wrong with the old one? Ooh, nothing, I just want a new one. Anything else? All excess, all the extra stuff. How about the fact that, that we can see people in need and not help them? How about... How about not being generous with what we have? How about all the new stuff that we want to buy? How about every time we look at somebody that like we know that's a neighbor or a friend of ours and we see what they have, we're like, oh, I want to have that too. There are lots of ways that we show we care more about our resources than about God. And I think it's important for us to wrestle with that a little bit together because it's easy to read some of these stories from 2,000 years ago and go, well, I'm not building any extra barns. That doesn't apply to me. I don't have a ton of grain that I'm trying to store somewhere. I mean, maybe a couple of you do, but probably not most. So how does this apply to us? Well, it applies with all the things we just said. There are lots of ways that you and I do the exact same thing that the rich man in the story does, where we hoard our wealth and our resources, and we show that we care more about those resources than about God. And Jesus is going to offer us a different perspective, a different way to prioritize how we spend money, how we spend time, how we do things. And he says it in verse 22. Look in your Bibles. He says to his disciples, that is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food to eat or enough clothes to wear. Pay attention to that wording. Do you have enough food to eat to survive? Do you have enough clothes to wear to not die of the cold? It's interesting to me that we are so quick to worry about our finances. I looked up this week, what's the number one concern according to polls for Americans today? And it's, it's inflation. Will I have enough money in three months to continue, not to survive, but the same lifestyle? Will I be able to, to travel as much and afford all the gas that's now, you know, $15 a gallon for some reason? Will I be able to afford all the same things that I'm used to affording? The the financial worry that we experience, financial worry is one of the number one causes of divorce and marriages. Worrying about finances is something we are so quick to do. This is what the rich man cared all about. Now, the rich man's whole thing was, I'm going to hoard all of my wealth so that I will always be comfortable. I always want to be comfortable. And that's where our worry about inflation comes from. It's, it's not so much, will I have enough to eat or survive? It's more, will I have enough to you know, have the things that I, that I want to have? Now, it leads us to a very interesting and important question, and one that's really not technically a part of this message, but if we don't cover it, somebody could walk away with the wrong idea. If you've been around here for a while, you won't because you've heard this before, but it's important that we cover it for anyone that's new. Is it wrong to save money? 
Is Jesus saying you shouldn't have any savings, you shouldn't have any insurance, you shouldn't have any investments, you shouldn't do any of that stuff because then you're not trusting in God? Is it wrong to save up money? And the answer to that, you probably all know, is no. No, in fact, it's biblical to save money. That's what's so confusing about what Jesus says here. It almost seems like he's saying, well, you shouldn't be saving up anything. You should sell everything you have and give it all to the poor and then just trust God to provide for you. Is that what he's saying? Well, the problem with that is when God led Joseph to save up all the grain in Egypt so that it could provide for people during the famine or in Proverbs 6, which teaches us to be like the ant and gather enough resources in the good times to prepare for the bad times. Proverbs 21 says the hands of the diligent lead to abundance and that treasure and oil are in a wise man's house. But a foolish person consumes everything and doesn't save anything. So a wise person, the Bible says, is going to have some things saved up. Proverbs 3 teaches that whoever honors God with their resources will have plenty and even more than they need. So it's, it's biblical to save. It's biblical to invest. It's biblical to have some resources set aside for emergencies and for the future. That's wise. So what is Jesus talking about here? I think it's important that we just acknowledge both of these truths. I'll get to the Jesus part in a little bit, but hey, if you're a follower of Jesus and you want to follow these principles that I just ran through in the Bible, you need to have an emergency fund. You need to have probably three to six months worth of savings that's liquid, that's accessible to you in case something happens. It's a good idea to have insurance if you're in a situation where you, you need that and you've got a family that needs to be cared for if something happens to you. It's a good idea for you to have um, investments and take advantage of the tools that are available. That's the modern way of being like the ant and saving up for a difficult time in the future and making sure that you're being wise and preparing. You're a wise steward of the resources God has given you. Those are wise things to do. You know, you look at the last couple of years, it's really interesting to see what happens in the stores when all of a sudden there's a, a pandemic and, and, and everything is just gone. And sometimes you can't even go to the stores or you, you're picking and choosing what you're actually able to get. Other countries had it even worse than we did. I've been through storms where for a couple of weeks, the store shelves were empty. And I forget who it was that said that, that you're basically, I think it was something like nine meals away from total anarchy or something like that. You can see how it, it's a wise thing to be prepared. And we, we've gotten so used to and so comfortable with the fact that we can just hop down to the store and grab what we want. But I think it's probably a biblical wise thing for us to do to have some stuff saved up. I think it's wise for us to not just have some money saved up, but even have some food and some basic supplies that if we need to, we can get through a, a difficult time. I think that's a wise biblical thing to do. And so I don't think what Jesus is saying here is that it's not good for you to have anything saved. The problem with the rich man is that he is not a wise, godly steward saving up for difficult times. The problem with the rich man is that he didn't say, let me build barns and then create this uh, opportunity for people who have need to come and get some of my resources. He didn't say, I want to save a portion of what I have that God has blessed me with and then give the rest away to help people or make it available at a very low cost to them. He didn't say that. Let me build barns. Let me save it all for myself. It's all for me so that I can be comfortable. Me, me, I, I, I. It was all about him. It was all, it was all his selfishness. And because of that selfishness, Jesus says, God said to him, you will die this very night. And then what's going to happen with everything that you saved up? The problem was this man wanted to hoard it all for himself. He's greedy. He's selfish. And this gives us the application for the story that Jesus says in, in, in a paraphrase. Don't be consumed by worry for material things on earth. Your heavenly father will care for you. Don't be consumed by worry for material things on earth. Not that it's wrong to save, not that it's wrong to invest, not that we don't want to go to that extreme. That's not what Jesus is saying. But to be consumed by worry, to hoard all of your stuff, to not share with others, to not treat it as a, a temporary blessing from God is just foolish because you could lose your life tomorrow. The way Jesus illustrates this point, I think, is really beautiful. He says in verse 27, look at the lilies and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautiful as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for the flowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. And then he says something that I think is really interesting. Why do you have so little faith? 
You're worried about clothes. You're worried about food. This is really a lack of faith. Lack of faith in what? A lack of faith in God. Jesus is connecting this concern with food and clothes with a lack of faith in God. Why? Because if you trust in God, he's going to provide for you. Now, I thought about this a lot this week, and I wrestled with how to communicate this because I, I don't fully relate. And here's what I mean. I don't know how this hits you, but here's how it hits me. Do you know the last time I worried about having enough food to survive? I'm not sure it's ever happened. The last time I worried about having clothes and being stuck out in the elements and not having any shelter to be able to sleep in, it may have happened once. This is not something that I struggle with, the basic necessities. And, I, and, and maybe some of you do, I don't know, but I would guess that for most of us listening today, we're not worried about whether or not we're going to have clothes tomorrow. What we're worried about is if it's the right clothes. We're not worried about whether we're going to have food to eat tomorrow. What we're worried about is if it's going to be that stuff that's made with oats instead of almond flour right? We're worried about preferences and styles and lifestyles. Most of us, I don't think, are worried about whether we'll be able to survive. And yet that's the point that Jesus is making here. Jesus is saying, you shouldn't even worry about the basic essentials of food and clothing, whether you'll have enough food or enough clothes to survive. If you worry about that level of things, he says, you lack faith in God. Why do you have so little faith? Now, what does that say for you and me who aren't worried about the basics? We're worried about the preferences. What does that say for my concern that I'm going to have the item that I want that's big enough, that's nice enough? All the things that you talked about earlier are the ways we show we care more about resources than about God. What does that say about that when that's where our worry is? Here's what Jesus says. In verse 29, don't be concerned about what to eat and what to drink. Don't worry about such things. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers all over the world. They dominate the thoughts of unbelievers all over the world. But your father already knows your needs. They dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. How about the thoughts of believers? What to eat, what to drink, what to wear, all the stuff that we want to do, all the preferences that we have, these dominate our thoughts? Yeah. They dominate the thoughts of believers too. So let's talk about the alternative. What is the principle that we can pull out of this that Jesus is getting at? It's in verse 31. He says, seek the kingdom of God above all else, and he will give you everything you need. Not everything you want, but everything you need. So don't be afraid, little flock, for it gives your father great happiness to give you the kingdom. Here's the principle. The principle is trust God, and he will care and provide for you. Trust God and he will care and provide for you. And for someone who has very little, for anyone who has almost nothing, this is an incredible promise. Man, I trust in God and he will provide for me. That's incredible. Worry means a lack of faith in God and seeking God's kingdom means never worrying about provision because God will provide what you need. But here's the thing, for that person who doesn't have much, and reads this and goes, oh my goodness, I trust in God and he's going to provide what my need. You know how God usually provides for those needs? How does God usually provide for the needs of people that really have needs? Go ahead. Through others. Through other people. Through, through his children. God uses us. He blesses us so that we can be a blessing to others. He blesses us immensely. So that he can then take and use us as his hands and feet to be the solution to Luke 12, to the people that don't have much. God is using people to, to fulfill his promise, to provide for people who are trusting in him. Or maybe they're not even trusting in him yet. But they will because of how God's children responded to God when he prompted them and said, I want you to go provide for someone in need. Luke 12, 33 says, Sell your possessions and give to those in need. This will store up treasure for you in heaven. And the purses of heaven never get old or develop holes. Your treasure will be safe. No thief can steal it. No moth can destroy it. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. If we pull all of this together, what we can say is, don't be like the rich man who hoarded everything he had. 
Yes, it's biblical and it's wise to save up for emergencies and invest, but you don't need to worry about it. You don't need to have anxiety about it. Trust God. Seek his kingdom. He will provide what you need. And if you have anything to spare, here's what Jesus is saying. I'm going to paraphrase it for you. This is the action step at the end. Value God and his kingdom so much more than your resources that you'll trade one for the other. I know that is a little challenging, so let me read that again. Value God and his kingdom so much more than your resources that you'll trade one for the other. If you have been here when we've done a series on money or any of the messages where we've covered money and those sorts of things, you've probably heard me say that God's economy is different than man's economy, but the two are connected. That's the thing we often miss. There is a connection between man's economy and God's economy, and Jesus is saying it right here. He's saying, use your earthly treasure to build treasure in heaven. There is a, there's an exchange rate between man's economy and God's economy. Now, what does that look like exactly? I don't know for sure. Building treasure in heaven. I mean, for one thing, it's God when you show up saying, well done, good and faithful servant. I mean, that's treasure. It's the crowns that God will give that we will then throw at Jesus' feet. It's it's the people who will be there because we sacrificed and we gave and we served in ways that brought people into the kingdom. It it may be other things that we can't even think of or fathom right now. The way that God fulfilled the prophecies of the Old Testament was was mind-blowing to the people back then because they had no idea how he was going to do that stuff. Jesus revealed this to the two on the road to Emmaus, how all the Old Testament scriptures pointed to him in ways we still don't know yet. There's a lot of stuff we're not going to figure out until we get to heaven. But what we do know is that Jesus is saying right here, you need to use some of your earthly treasure to build up treasure in heaven. And it's worthwhile. It's worth doing. It's so much better than hoarding it all for yourself. One of the greatest joys of being in ministry is actually seeing this play out. We get to see this play out all the time here at the church and in ways that that you never even know about. I mean, for instance, um, just recently, we were able to give two cars away to people that didn't have cars. Um, That was a need that they had, transportation, be able to get to work. And so the church was able to provide those cars for people. Every month, the church gets to provide for utility bills and food and all sorts of resources to people that have needs. And it's not something that gets widely publicized, but, but you being a part of this church, this family, means that, that we're doing this. We're living this out. And today, what we want to invite you into is an opportunity to do that even more in a very strategic way, in a long-term partnership with a new church being planted in Huamachuco, Peru. This is the church plant that we raised funds for together so that they could build a a new church building and they could build a student center and they could reach this whole community for Jesus. But there's an incredibly effective way of doing that, and it's thanks to the partnership with Compassion and this church plant, which is part of a Christian Missionary Alliance church plant. They're, they're, they have a mother church that's helping them as well, but we're providing the funding to, to provide the facilities and everything. And we want to do more than that. We don't want to just help build the building and say, okay, we, we did our good thing and now we're done. We actually want to have a strategic, long-term partnership with this place. That includes us continuing to sponsor the kids in the community. They've identified something like 140 kids in the area that are eligible for a compassion sponsorship program that we can then sponsor as a church so they can get all sorts of needs taken care of. It's amazing. This is a place where malnutrition is a huge issue. Abuse is a huge issue. Families don't have enough to live on. It's it's an incredibly poor area. Not everything around there, but certain pockets are incredibly poor. And we have an opportunity through this church plant and through compassion to go in and make an incredible difference in this place, to provide education and food and clothing and medicine and, and Christian mentors and activities at the church, a place where the kids can go and be safe and be loved and be a part of something that's really incredible. And you and I get a chance to be a part of it. And how they're doing it 
It's the most effective thing I have ever seen. And that's, that's saying something. Cause I, I have seen works done in countries all over the world. I've, I've never seen something that has so much promise and so much effectiveness. John and I were able to meet young adults who grew up in the Compassion program and were sponsored kids and, and see what they were doing in their churches and how they had graduated from university and had studied to become teachers and, and all sorts of different things. And we saw firsthand the effectiveness of sponsoring a kid and what that can do to lift someone out of poverty. $38 a month, and it provides everything the kid needs. And it doesn't just help the kid, it helps their family because now the family resources can stretch further because that kid is being cared for and provided for. And guess what? Now that family is going to have this great perspective on the church that's helping to care for their kids because it's not even really a, a major push for compassion. It's all about that local church and making sure there's this connection between the church and the kids and the families. It's unbelievable what this can do for a community. And so we're not asking you to just give money to sponsor some random kid somewhere. What we're asking you to do today, if you pray about it and you're willing, is to actually select a child, a real child, where you can see their name and, and read about their family and what they do and what their interests are and see their picture and to sponsor that child. And then to communicate with that child and send them messages and hear back from them and send them pictures and, and enter a relationship with them. And, and maybe even a child specifically from the church that we're helping to plant in Huamachuco. And so in the back today, we have dozens of these. these. You can't have these. These are mine. So we're sponsoring Yadiel, Judah, and Eliza. And so you can't have these, but in the back, there are a bunch of other packets back there of specific individual kids. There are no duplicates. And if you see the ones that have the blue church partner sticker right in the middle at the bottom, that's the church that we're partnering with in Huamachuco. And so you can actually sponsor a child who is within the region of this church's influence, who will actually be going to the student center that we're providing the funds to help build. There are too many people that want to sponsor kids. And so there are other packets. I mean, a terrible problem to have. There are other packets back there that have a brown church partner sticker on them. And those are in the general area, but might not go to that specific um, student center that we're working with. But they're still in that region of Peru. And so if you want to sponsor a child who is part of the specific church plant that we are working with, it's the blue sticker. Brown is the general region, might not go to that exact place, but all of these kids need sponsors. This is an incredible thing that we get to do, that we get to be a part of. And really what we want to do is encourage you to do every part of Luke 12. Do every part of Luke 12. Don't worry about your finances, about your future, about your resources. Trust in God. Seek his kingdom. Be willing to sacrifice, sacrifice some of the excess that you have and be God's provision for someone else, someone that you may not know right now, but you'll get to know them, someone who you can make a real difference in their life. And what if we all do this? What if 10 years from now, 20 years from now, as we go and we visit this place and we meet the people that we've sponsored and we see what's happened in this community, what if we see a community that's been absolutely transformed? from one of malnutrition and abuse and, and abject poverty to one where there is real life happening, not just because of the economic difference, but because of the difference that Jesus makes in their lives. What if we see a community where the church is thriving to the point where they're now helping send out to other areas and plant churches to other parts of Peru? Wouldn't that be something you'd want to be a part of? Isn't that the treasure in heaven that you want to invest in? It's the, it's the one I want to invest in. And so that's what we're encouraging you to do today. Before you leave today, before you go into the activity center, before you go out into the parking lot and all that stuff, stop at the tables in the back. Look at the kids who need sponsors. Pick one or two or three or 10 or whatever up and sponsor a child to be a part of this with us. We think God is gonna do amazing things and we want you to be a part of it with us. Let me pray before we close. We're not gonna have a song today. You're gonna be released right after this. Heavenly Father, we thank you for what you are already doing in the world. We know that you've invited us to be your co-laborers, not to do the work ourselves, but not to be uninvolved, to be a part of it. This is one of the most amazing opportunities I've seen for someone here in St. Louis to be a part of what you're doing around the world. You've already put it into the heart of the CMA church in El Porvenir to plant a church in Huamachuco, and Pastor Frank is there and ready to get started. And, and you've 
made this possible for us to have this connection where we can help provide the resources to build the new church and the student center. And now you've given us this opportunity to actually sponsor the individual kids who are going to be a part of this ministry. And this could be just life-changing for them, life-changing for their families, life-changing for the whole community and have a ripple effect on the whole region. God, I pray that we don't miss it. I pray that you'd help us to be bold, to stand up, to do exactly what you told us to do, to sacrifice some of our excess, to help people who are in need to store up treasure in heaven, God. May we answer that call today. And I pray that years from now, we would see an incredible impact from this, God, that you would do your work, that you would get all the glory and all the credit for it. But thank you, Jesus, for allowing us here at First Free Church to be a part of it. We pray all this in Jesus' name, amen.